Cook believes in the importance of data transparency, and we want to make the Zilver PTX data set uh, as easily accessible as possible to physicians, to researchers, and to patients, so they can further review and, and evaluate the details of the patient-level data that's been presented. Well, I believe the field is very concerned about the Katsanos article, and I think they're really sort of demanding this type of level data so they can look at it themselves, come to their own conclusions. So this is a big step forward. So the five-year data set, we looked at again in a as-treated basis, and we found that 40% of the patients not originally treated with a drug when it went on to get drug treatment within that first year, and this was pre-prescribed in the protocol. At five years then, where there should have been plenty of time for any type of signal to come about, there was no difference between the drug eluting stent and the plain balloon angioplasty or plain uh, metal stent at that point in time, so we didn't see any signal in that patient population. Cook worked with the authors to submit a correction to the journal shortly after Katsano's paper was published in December, uh, and that correction came out in February. It's also important to note uh, that these incorrect mortality numbers were only present in the five-year data publication. None of the numbers submitted to regulatory agencies or used in any of our analyses uh, have been incorrect. So these have no impact on what's been presented by Cook or by physicians. I think this is one of the interesting debates that we're having now. What is really the most relevant and the fairest way to look at the data that's coming out? Should it be as an intent to treat, but certainly for efficacy endpoint is the most conservative where we want a real burden of proof to show that the drug or the treatment actually is doing better than the control. But when it comes to a mortality signal, is a drug or a device associated with an increased risk of mortality? I think what's really important to patients and physicians is who got that treatment compared to who did not. And so, as Dr. Ansel mentioned earlier, 40% of the patients initially randomized to PTA or bare, bare metal stent went on to get the drug within the first year. So, Zilver PTX, there were 31 patients who within that first year of follow-up by protocol were allowed for the re-intervention to have Zilver PTX. If we include those as, as treated, along with the group that was primarily randomized to Zilver PTX or secondarily randomized to provisional Zilver PTX treatment after a failed PTA, you end up with a very different group than the primary randomization. And if when you take that into account, there was absolutely no difference for those patients who ultimately got the drug Pacotaxol and those who didn't. Both had roughly an 18% mortality at five years. And again, intent to treat, yes, it's a very important way to look at data analysis, but in this case, I think as treated is really the most relevant to patients, and that's why there's such a big difference. In the Casanos analysis, he did a dose analysis primarily based on the drug-coated balloon type of dimensions, length times diameter times dose density, and then times time for the amount of dose and how long they got it. This was fine for the drug-coated balloons, but inaccurate for the drug eluting stent, where only 20% of the lumen is covered by a stent. So that calculation should have gone by that and then times 0.2 which would make it the lowest dose device, not the high, one of the highest dose devices. Thus, the original mortality, which was only an intention to treat, was ascribed to a high dose device by density, but in fact was a low, one of the lowest dose devices you could have. So this really led to a miscalculation of the dose response, for which for me in this article carried most of the um, heavyweight proof because if there's no dose response, it's hard to ascribe as to why this is occurring because of the drug itself. As Dr. Ansel has mentioned, uh, Zilver PTX surface area is only about 20%. So due to that lower surface area of a stent compared to a balloon um, and the fact that the Zilver PTX stent is only coated on the outer surface, uh, the total amount of Pacotaxel on a, a Zilver PTX is only about 10 to 20 percent of that on a DCB.
Very interesting that in the randomized clinical trial, by protocol, a very few number of patients were CLI, but in Dr. Sosemski's uh, presentation here at Charing Cross, from the Medicare database, 51% of his patients had CLI. And this analysis showed that if you had CLI, you had a much almost twice as high mortality uh, as if not CLI patients. So roughly for CLI at five years, 60% mortality, whether you got a bare metal stent or a drug eluding stent, as opposed to non-CLI, where it was in low 30s, 32, 33%. But the key is that for both CLI and non-CLI patients, there was absolutely no difference. The curves are absolutely congruent between those who got a bare metal stent and those who got a drug eluding stent. So I think this really generalizes from the randomized clinical trial to a much more at-risk population with CLI showing no difference between the two. Though I think we still have to honor the FDA's request to use other devices, the current data set as treated combined with the CMS data set at multiple years, neither of which have shown a sign or a signal of increased mortality, are very strong indicators that in the long run, I think we're really going to see that Silver PTX plays out as a safe device. We do have to wait for the, the uh, big meta-analysis of the patient-level data for all drug devices, but I think that even adding in the drug eluting stents in the first place, which is, is an amorphous compound, minimal embolization, not with an excipient, really kind of made it difficult to put in that article in the first place, and we'll see how that plays out. I think if you allow the perhaps the most relevant analysis would be compare those patients who got placotaxel on the stent versus those who didn't. So in other words, an as-treated analysis. As, we, as Dr. Ansel alluded to, there's no difference in those patients out through five years. However, there is still a very large percentage of patients who are lost to follow-up. 40%, and that's not unusual for any trial. We usually figure about 10% a year will be lost to follow-up. So now I think the challenge for Cook is to go find these patients who were lost and understand how many are still alive, how many died, and what their treatment was. Now even if we took the group that we have without the loss to follow up and threw out the 31 patients, censored them because they crossed over, if you will, and had as a re-intervention Zilver PTX and compared the two groups based on that ra the randomization without, you would still see no significant difference between the two. So I think the real challenge now is to get and expand that data set to the previously lost to follow up so that we can really, at least for this particular trial, go on to really understand if there is a difference or not.